If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark, the second chapter, Mark 2. Mark is in the New Testament. Amen. Hallelujah. Teresa, it's good to see you and your mama. Hey, mama. Uh, that's all right. It's good to see you, see both of you. Mark 2. Mark 2. Verses 1 through 12, I'll do the reading. Um, so you guys can just follow along whatever uh, translation or version that, you, uh, that you're in. Uh, this, this story here um, is a very popular story. Not only is it um, spelled out in a couple of different places in the Gospels, um, Mark is not the only um, person who uh, wrote uh, on this particular story. Mark did, I mean uh, Matthew did, and Luke did as well. And this is a story that I'm sure that you all have uh, probably heard before, uh, maybe familiar with. Um, it's actually one of my favorite uh, short stories um, in the Bible um, because of the brash display of faith uh, that the paralytic man's friends had uh, for, his, for his particular healing. Amen. And, um, and so let's take a look at it here. Mark 2, Mark 2 starting at verse 1, and it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and the he that they're talking about is referencing Christ. And it was heard that he was in the house. Somebody say, Jesus is in the house. Come on, anytime Jesus is in the house, that's a, good, that's a, that's a place to be, amen? And it says, Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Hallelujah. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. That's a whole nother story. I admire your faith, but don't tear my roof up. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know who else they was in. I hope he had insurance. Amen. Now he's going to explain that to your insurer. How you going, what, what you going, what category are you going to put that claim under? Anyways, so they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven you. And verse 6 said, and some of the scribes, uh, which are just religious leaders, were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, uh, saying, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And verse 8 says, but immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reason like this within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven you or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And verse 12 says, immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never saw anything like this. Uh, this, this passage, um, as I uh, mentioned previously, is a very familiar passage, a very familiar story. Um, if you've uh, you know, been a Christian for a while or been in church or around churches for some time, where it, you know, it highlights this, um, this uh, really incredible story of um, when a person who was in a very, very um, bad condition and couldn't have faith for themselves, for, for his self, um, but his friends stood in the gap and they had faith for him. They had enough faith to believe that if they got him to this meeting, if they took him to this meeting where Jesus, where they had heard Jesus was preaching and ministering, um, that, that Christ may potentially heal them. Amen. And can I just tell you something? Those are the kind of friends all of us need. Amen. That's, hey, listen, when, when life starts lifing and things happen, you don't need friends like Job had. If you don't know Job's story, I encourage you to go back and read it on your own. 
Job's life started falling apart, and they were like, what you do? Job, you must have sinned, something wrong with you. You know, your kids have got, your kids have died, you've lost all your assets, your wife tripping, you got boils all over your body. And they started blaming Job for the condition of what was transpiring in his life. None of us need those kind of friends. We need the kind of friends that when, uh, you know, something happens in life, which it can happen to any of us, irrespective of how long you've been born again, uh, you know, what your testimony in Jesus is or not, or how much faith you claim to have or don't have. All of us go through seasons in life where we need somebody to carry us when we can't carry ourselves. <laughs> Hallelujah. So typically when this story is shared or preached or taught, it is shared from that angle, talking about um, the, the demonstrative faith that the paralytic uh, paralytics uh, man's friends uh, displayed um, as they brought him to this meeting to get healed. Hallelujah. Amen. And, uh, but that's not the focus of my, uh, my message this morning. My focus is on what I deem to be uh, the most central part um, or the most essential part of this entire story, which is what Jesus said to him once he was let down through the roof in the middle of the meeting while Jesus was preaching, and that message uh, that Jesus proclaimed over this man's life was, paralytic man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, when I read the Bible, and all of us should take this approach when we, when we read Scripture, you should, you should approach the text and ask yourself certain questions, what, like why would, he, why would he do that? Why would he not say... You're, you're healed, like he had did, done to so many other people. If you've ever read uh, Jesus' story, followed his ministry in the Gospels, um, when people brought uh, sick people, demonized people, all kind of stuff, hurting people to Jesus all the time, and Jesus would heal them, right, with no uh, condition, no prerequisite uh, that they had to meet. He would, they would just bring them and say, hey, my son's sick, my daughter's sick, and Jesus say, hey, you know, lay hands or speak a word, and they'd be healed. So why in this case, or this instance, um, did Jesus say to the paralytic, instead of saying you're healed, why did he say your sins are forgiven? Those are the type of questions that we should ask ourselves as we're studying God's holy word. Amen. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of uh, insight to, um, uh, as to why uh, Jesus opted to take that approach um, but I can just tell you from a practical sense or practical way of just working with people through the years um, that sometimes your sin can cause, your, your internal sin can cause external conditions. So there are times where when we harbor unforgiveness and we harbor bitterness and we harbor uh, offense and we harbor we, whatever, whatever, it, whatever it is, uh, that we harbor, we hold these things into our hearts our lives, or what have you, and we don't follow the proper remedy to forgive a person or to have a conversation that is uh, well overdue or whatever it might be, and we just hold those things in and we fester over them and uh, stir over them and meditate over them every time we see them or we think about this person or whatever, we just get angry over and over and over again. If that is not properly dealt with in the proper time frame, it can cause external con health conditions in your life. I'm just telling you from experience what I've seen. Amen? And, and, in, and in this uh, particular scenario, it is quite interesting because this man um, was actually paralyzed. It doesn't it didn't say what kind or type of paralysis um, you know, what happened if he was in an accident or, uh, you know, he just woke up one morning and he was paralyzed or uh, if he was paralyzed from birth. It doesn't say any of those things. It just gave us insight into his condition that he had a debilitating health condition so much so that he couldn't even walk on his own, right, which we could uh, probably allude to that he probably couldn't bathe on his own and he probably couldn't uh, you know, go to the mailbox on his own. He probably was unemployed. He probably couldn't work if he was paralyzed, right? So this man had this condition, uh, and Jesus said to him, Mr. Paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. 
Now, I find this, um, you know, quite interesting because, uh, you know, like I said before, that you, you, when you read the text, there's so many different stories where, um, where Jesus didn't put that prerequisite on a person. He just did what that person asked for or the people that were, came along with the person asked for and then sent them on their merry way. He may have said to them like he did to uh, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. You remember uh, he said to her, you know, after he had, you know, liberated her not just from her sin and the guilt and the shame that accompanied her condition, but also her accusers, right, the people that wanted to stone her and kill her. And what did he say to her when he released her from all of that? He said, go your way and sin no more. Right, And so there's all of these types of instances, and they have to be looked at um, in, in, uh, in a, uh, you know, a, a one-on-one fashion. Uh, I, I recall, I can't remember what year it was, uh, but we were on a short-term missions trip to India, and we, we saw something like this. Teresa, who I mentioned earlier, was actually with me on that trip, and uh, I mean, my son, I think AJ, and a few others, uh, and we were on a trip, uh, we were in Southeast Asia, and uh, at this, I was speaking at this, um, this church's eighth anniversary, their service, and, uh, and I was, you know, administered, and, uh, you know, our team ministered, and the service was ending. And at the end of that service, um, you know, there were, I think, two men, two or three men, I can't remember if it was three, I know for sure it was two, um, they, 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 uh, proceeded to bring this man from the back of the uh, building. He had been, it was a very, uh, it wasn't a real large facility. It, it was packed. People were on the floor. Every seat was taken. Hundreds of people. And, um, and they brought this man up to the stage where we uh, were. We were just off the platform um, to ask me to pray for him. And they were carrying him. And when I saw them carrying him, I immediately thought about this story. And I said, oh, God. I ain't Jesus, amen? I said, I know him, but I ain't him. And, and so they were carrying this man, and obviously there's a language difference, a barrier. And so they said to, uh, through the, the, my interpreter, uh, they said that this was their friend. Um, he hasn't been able to walk in three months. And they said just one day he woke up, and it was like something, uh, they said, attacked his legs, and he hasn't been able to walk or drive or do anything anymore. And he was, uh, in, in uh, his profession, he was an auto driver. An auto is just a taxi. Uh, you see these all in different countries in Asia, these small, um, you know, they look like bikes almost. They look like little cabs, and they, um, that's their job. They cart people all around um, the city. And they said that that was his job, and he hasn't been able to work, and, you know, such and such, such and such. And they said, you know, can you pray for him? And I said, yes, I can. And I said, Lord, listen here. Don't fail me now, Jesus. <laughs> My God. And so I asked them to sit the, the gentleman in a chair, and, and uh, they sat him in the chair, and I laid hands on him because the Bible says if you lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. And um, so I laid hands on him and, um, and prayed a prayer over him and then asked him uh, at, the, at the conclusion of that prayer to stand. And obviously I was asking him to do something that he hadn't done in 90 days, and so when he couldn't stand on his own, we helped him to stand. And, and he stood, and his leg is wobbled, and he plopped back down in the chair. And um, so I prayed again. And as we prayed, and, uh, you know, everyone was, so many people were surrounding us. And, um, and we prayed again, laid hands on him again. But this time I, I, I uh, remember purposefully saying, I rebuke the spirit that has attacked this man's leg and um, prayed for him, laid hands on him again, and pulled him up out of the chair. And this man, y'all, uh, there used to be a dance, was real popular in the 90s. It was called the Humpty Hump Dance. Some of y'all is too old, and some of y'all is too young to remember that, but it was a Humpty Hump song, and then we would do this little move <laughs> at the dance when you was really trying to get hype, trying to get the party hype, and that is literally what that man did. Now, he didn't do the Humpty Hump. <laughs> But he stood up out of that chair, he did that move, and he walked out of that door. I share that story because the Lord didn't prompt me in that moment to say to him, your sins are forgiven you. 
God just healed them according to his friend's faith and according to our faith. Amen? But in this story that we just read, the Lord definitively says to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. And I believe because somewhere, someplace in this man's life, um, he had opened up the door, uh, you know, through some kind of sinful conduct, choice, what have you, and it caused his, uh, uh, his paralytic or paralysis condition, which caused this man not to be able to walk or do many things for himself over the course of, uh, could have been many years, amen? And so, and I have, you know, one thing that I know um, just about people and um, just working with people, leading people in so many different contexts, uh, throughout my uh, career and throughout my ministry is that it seems as if forgiveness, rendering it and receiving it is one of the hardest things for people to do. I have had people in my office um, who have had all kinds of issues. Uh, I'm talking about outward issues, health issues, you know, uh, spiritual issues, and, uh, you know, and and I felt like the Lord had, would, had told me to tell them, well, well, hey, if you forgive this person, then those, condi those conditions that you're dealing with uh, will eventually heal themselves and they'll go away. But you've got to forgive. And I have had people, as certain as my name is Warren, look me in my eyes and say, Pastor, I'm not doing that. I can't do that. I'm not willing to do that. Because what he did to me, what she did to me, is unforgivable. And in those moments, whew, I sit as a student of God's word, as a believer in Jesus, as a disciple myself, and I just ponder this Christian saying to me that what they did was unforgivable, and I'm just like, man, when I look at the context of my own life, and how much we've done and how much we have not done and God still forgave us. And so even though people do heinous things, people do some of the most craziest things, uh, real and perceived, um, but y'all, nothing is unforgivable, not when you're a believer. It's just that is not your option. You may have to work on certain things, you know, take baby steps towards the end goal of forgiveness. It doesn't mean that the relationship will be reconciled, amen, right? But it does mean that at some point you cannot live in a state of paralysis any longer because of your refusal or unwillingness to forgive whatever party that offended you or hurt you. Because one thing that I know about unforgiveness or the lack of forgiveness is that naturally, like this paralytic, it can paralyze you. And spiritually in life, it can paralyze you and stop all progress in your life from moving forward. All of us know and have met people through the years who seem stuck in a certain t uh, era of time. And I'm not talking about like 60s and person dressing or looking like Elvis or whatever, the 80s with Michael Jackson, or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about every time you have a conversation with them, they're constantly rehashing or bringing up to you some, uh, something that transpired and took place that caused them deep trauma. We're not saying that that's not real. Deep, you know, woundedness in their soul, but they can't move past that. And I'm just telling you um, as your brother in the Lord that that's a very dangerous place to be in. Hallelujah. That's a very, very dangerous place to be in. Amen. When we forgive people, y'all, it's, um, it's simply um, letting them go. No longer charging the offense to their account. Uh, no longer, um, you know, when you see them, that you're stirred up emotionally even if the incident or series of incidents transpired 25 or 30 years ago and you still see them all these years later, these decades later, and you're still bound emotionally, 
mentally, you know, sometimes physically to this person where you have start having these physiological reactions in your body based on an offense that took place decades prior. We have forgiveness in a nutshell, to sum it up, is to let it go. And I have learned that offense is more of a choice of a person's will, where you choose to forgive. Even if, you're, even if your emotions haven't caught up yet to forgive, or your, you know, whatever hasn't caught up yet, but you, because you understand that if you don't forgive, this is the danger of unforgiveness, that if we make a choice not to forgive, the Bible says that God will not forgive us. And that is a very, very, very dangerous place to be. God who sent his only child to die for the sin of humanity, right? To die for the sin of the entire world, whether people accepted him or not or believe him or not, died for the sin of all. It's like this, when you choose not to forgive, it's like saying or implying that Jesus came to die for everybody except you. Because you can't receive his substitutionary sacrifice because of your unwillingness to bend your will and forgive another person. Hallelujah. If you think about, out of all the things, the disciples, the, you know, the ones that walked with Christ, uh, the 12 that walked with him initially, um, they're referred to uh, in Scripture and also in uh, kind of theological terms as the apostles of the Lamb, meaning they actually physically walked with the Lamb of God who was sent to take away the sin of the world and no other party, no other person in history will ever be able to don or wear that title. And when they walked with, uh, when they walked with Christ, Peter, uh, Andrew, James, uh, John, uh, you know, Matthew, uh, whatever, all the names, all the different, Judas, all the different people, when they walked with him, um, I am certain that they saw and experienced many things that we have no biblical record of. Right, they saw, they were with this man every day for about three, three and a half years. They saw, man, they, man, they probably saw some cool stuff. Amen. And out of all the things that they saw or all the things that they could have asked Jesus to do for them, they asked and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Out of all the things they could have asked, they could have said, like today's people, they'd have been like, teach me how to do a miracle. Teach me how to turn water into wine. I know you wine drinker sales in here. Come on, somebody. I got the wine at home today with your lamb. Come on, you eating your lamb, your Easter lamb and wine, trying to spiritualize it. You'd be like, Lord, anoint me to turn the water into wine. Or anoint me to raise the dead. Or, you know, there are so many things that, we, that they could have asked him. But they asked him, they said, teach me how to pray. And he didn't give them a, a methodology or a formula where you got to get up this time, or you got to pray this many times a day. He gave them more of a template to follow. And we commonly refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. And it simply says, our Father, and we, I mean, we know it just, our heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. But then he says, and forgive us of our sins, our trespasses, our shortcomings, as we forgive those who have trespassed or sinned against us. You see the condition? Forgive us. Our, everybody wants forgiveness, but everybody doesn't want to render forgiveness. But the prerequisite is that if you want to receive it, you got to give it. And there's no exceptions to that rule. They said, forgive us our debts. That's what forgiveness is. It's like forgiving a person's debt as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. They could have asked him anything, but they asked him specifically 
to teach us how to pray. And I find it so interesting that in that prayer, Jesus made sure to include the, 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 uh, the place or the space for people to say, hey, don't ever forget to ask for forgiveness. So you have a right to do that as you render forgiveness to those um, who are in need. And you know what's crazy about forgiveness is that most of the time the people that need it is the folk we don't want to give it to. The people that actually, in many cases, don't deserve it. Because y'all know we know and are related to, though y'all just keep looking straight. You ain't got to say nothing. I'm going to say it for you because I know you've been thinking it for a long time. We know and are related to some very interesting people in life, y'all. Oh, my God. You're like, Lord, what were you doing when you created this person? <laughs> did you run out of ideas? Like, what happened? What, what did you do when you created him? Why this personality, Lord? And, Lord, God forbid it be your child. Help us today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you can have or take issue um, with a lot of different kinds and types of people, right? Just think about, think about the, the context of your life and how many people you have had conflict with at some point, relatives, coworkers, neighbors, bosses, uh, adult children, come on, small children, you know, what have you, and how at some point you had to... Um, forgive them, uh, you know, for whatever conflict that, that may have gone unresolved. Uh, amen? Uh, I remember when I was a new Christian. Oh, new. I'm talking about new, new, uh, milk on my breath new. New, very new Christian. And, um, you know, trying to live this faith thing out. It was new to me at 22 years old, trying to walk it out and Figure it out, and, and I was playing basketball, and um, or trying to play basketball, and uh, and you know got into it uh, a a heated exchange, I'll say, with a fellow brethren that was on my team, and the guy wasn't a believer, not by a long shot, and he, even though we were on teams, you really couldn't tell. Because he was taunting me throughout the game. Now, this is my teammate. He's taunting me. Now, I was learning early on. I ain't know nothing like stuff I know about spiritual warfare. Now, I didn't know that stuff then. And so I know now that, you know, him saying things like holy boy, church boy, Bible. Th now, mind you, I, I've been saved a few days. If I show you pictures from them days, y'all would look like, like Warren, you wasn't holy on them pictures. I, listen. And he was, you know, a Bible thumper, just whatever. So now I understand it was a spiritual uh, battle, combat. His spirit, my, you know, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. But I didn't understand that then. Amen. I, I was still wanting to guard your grill and knuckle up. And he just kept saying that and kept saying it. And so when I got the ball, now mind you, we're on the same team. And when I got the ball, uh, I refused to pass the ball to him anymore. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know how to pray very well to, you know, manage your emotions and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, stuff that I wouldn't do today. I was, I was, whoo, so many thoughts was going through my mind of what I wanted to do to this man. Amen. And... And at some point, I was bringing the ball up court, and he just hollered and said something. I can't remember what it was. And have you ever been so angry that you see like a, fl like a flash? Somebody say, yes, quick. <laughs> There's like, yes, I'm mad about right now. Where it just, everything just flashed in a moment. And before I knew it, I, in mid-dribble, I took the ball, and I hurled it at his head as hard as I could. Y'all remember, y'all ever, ever played dodgeball growing up? Yeah. So you, you know, you, so you remember how hard we used to try to throw them balls? I did that with a basketball. I was trying to take his, I was trying to take skin off his head. <laughs> and simultaneously as I dribbled the ball, hurled it at him, I ran up on him. <laughs> I, was about, I was about to lay hands on him and it wasn't holy hands. Somebody grabbed me, they grabbed him, broke up, broke the fight up, and, 
you know, exchange of profanity and all kind of stuff. And, and uh, I walked away. I just said, okay, I quit this game because listen here, I'm, try, I'm trying to be saved. Amen. <laughs> and later on that evening, the Lord said to me, go apologize. I said, nah. He don't need no sorry. Nope. I ain't doing it, Jesus. Lord, did you not see that he was the one antagonizing, that he was the one saying this, that he was the one doing this? But the Lord just helped me to understand in those moments when people are in darkness, they're going to do what people can't see do. They're going to make those kinds and types of choices. But to whom much is given, warn much is required. And if you want to grow in grace and in faith, you have to, and I tell you to do something, you have to be willing to do it and respond immediately. <sighs> y'all, can I tell y'all, that was harder, uh, actually going to apologize, and I did. I went and apologized later, like, man, can I talk to you? Uh, oh, he's like, oh, look at this, so-and-so. Loud. I could say some words, y'all would know. What he look at this, so-and-so. Y'all, y'all, look at him. And I said, man, listen. I said, you know, what happened earlier, you know, it was out of character for me, and, you know, I just want to apologize to you and ask for your forgiveness. Ha! He started laughing. But it wasn't about his response. It was about my obedience. And that same kind of scenario applies to when we render forgiveness now. It's not how people respond or if they respond at all. Some people, some of you all here in this room or you listen to this by way of a radio broadcast, you know, you have issues with people who are not even here on earth anymore. They are dead and in their grave. Amen? And you have to learn how to release them from that whatever it was that you had or perceived that you had so that you can move forward and on in life and not be stuck or paralyzed at the point or place of injury. That is not God's will for, for you. It's not. It is not God's will for us not to be able to re respond and rebound from uh, times when, when people um, have uh, done, you know, things to us um, that, uh, that were really wrong and hurtful. Amen? Um, I, I have really learned just, in, in, again, in just working with people uh, over the years, y'all, in so many different capacities, that if you're really serious about moving your life forward, um, there are three things that I have learned to um, share with other folk and uh, whatever that are really, really important for people to implement um, if you're serious about not being stuck and moving your life forward as it pertains to forgiveness. Amen? And the first thing is forgiving yourself. Um, there are things. You know, taking up issue with ourselves, um, and you uh, are in a place where, um, you know, you might be grumpy or you might be whatever, um, because, you know, I, I see this a lot, people are not where they um, thought they, they'd be in life at a certain point, 43, I, you know, think I'd be married and have three kids, be here in my career, just whatever, and they get mad, they get mad at folk who, you know, they have no right to be mad at, and all kind of thing, but they also sometimes get mad at themselves for not making other decisions, not making different decisions earlier on in life or not making certain decisions sooner. And I am telling you that you have to learn to forgive yourself. It is so important <laughs> that you learn to forgive your Self. Forgive yourself for that one night stand with that person and produce a kid that you're now been tasked with the responsibility of raising. Forgive yourself. I'm like, oh my God, I knew I shouldn't have. Yeah, you shouldn't have, but you know what? Live and learn from it. Don't do it again. Move forward. Thank God for the beautiful child or children that you have. Raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and move forward, believing that God can clean up that mess. Come on, spill on aisle six that he can clean up that mess, give you a message out of that mess, 
give you a ministry sometimes out of that mess and move your life forward. But the prerequisite is you've got to forgive yourself. You've got to forgive yourself. That's the first thing. Hallelujah. I remember uh, someone that I love dearly and know, I've had a relationship with for many years, uh, told me they, um, uh, before we were talking about uh, matters of forgiveness, and uh, they, had had, they had a stroke some years ago, and, um, and, and parts of their body never responded fully um, after the stroke. You know, they were able to bounce back in many different ways, but certain parts of their body didn't respond back, and one part was um, the, one of their hands and arms just wouldn't work anymore. And uh, this person told me, they said, they said, Warren, I had to learn how to forgive my body for not responding because I was so angry um, at the fact that I had served God all these years and done all these things and yada, 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 and uh, my body didn't respond in the way that I thought it should respond. So instead of being grateful for the fact that I have mobility in one arm, which is perspective, because I could have lost mobility in both, I could have lost my life. I was angry at the fact that this one other arm wasn't working. So I had to learn to forgive my body for not responding and so I can move forward with my life. So those are just certain instances and examples, you guys, that fall under the umbrella or the category of forgiving yourself. Here's another one. Here's the second one is forgiving others. Uh, Matthew 18, 21, 22 gives us an interesting um, uh, short uh, summary, a short whatever when Jesus was having a conversation, I believe it was with Peter, his disciple, concerning the matter of the issue of forgiveness. And Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, how, if, if my brother sins against me, uh, how many times in a day should I forgive him? Should I forgive him seven times? He thought he was doing something. Amen. <laughs> He's thinking like it's only 24 hours in a day. You sleep eight of them. I mean, you got 16 hours left, you, you know, you work eight, and so you only got eight left to frolic, you know, and, and, and run, you know, tiptoe through the tulips. And so it's like if, if the eight, I don't have no conflict with somebody on my job or my business or this other eight, whatever, it's, it's yeah, I won't say it's impossible, but it's, most people ain't going to act that crazy where they're going to, you know, cut up on you seven different times in a day. Because after the second or the third time, we're going to have some words, Amen. I ain't going to let you keep acting no fool, okay? So Peter probably thought that he was really impressing the Lord and said, how many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me in a day? Seven times in a day. And Jesus said, no, nah, nope. Seventy times seven. If he sins against you 490 times in a day, you forgive him every time. G Peter said to Jesus, Lord, increase my faith. I'm saying, Peter, I'm right. Listen, if I was right there, I'd be like, Lord, increase mine too, because, Lord, you is tripping. <laughs> 500 times in a day? And you know, those, that category, how people can act up, can be very, very wide, very broad. Stuff that they may do, and you say it every single time, not in a week, not in a month, 490 times in a day? Yep, absolutely. Because you know why? You know where he gets that from? He gets that from himself. Because if you need forgiveness 490 times in a day, every time you ask in sincerity, he'll forgive you. Hallelujah. So if he can do it, we can do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> even when it's hard and even when we don't want to. Amen. And again, the danger of not obeying the Lord, let me say this and emphasize this because there are people that still don't do this. The danger that you put yourself in when you uh, essentially make yourself a God and say, I am not forgiving this person, the danger that you put yourself in is binding up your own self and, uh, and leaving your own self in a place where God won't forgive you. And I don't know if you know, uh, well, yeah, y'all know. We, we all know. Um, you know, when you sin uh, and you're a believer, you're a Christian, how dirty you feel. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How you lose peace. Um, I don't know about you, but I value peace. I grew up in a lot of chaos, and so peace is one of my top things. I value Peace, tranquility, serenity, whatever you want to call it, I value peace highly. 
So you sin, you feel dirty, you feel disconnected from God. Um, you know, peace, you're devoid of peace. Um, you know, if depending on the infraction, shame, guilt, condemnation, all those things can come. And depending on who you are, you're supposed to be a deacon, you're supposed to be an elder, you're supposed to be the pastor, you're supposed to be what, you know, whatever. You're supposed to be a Christian. So all of these things just seem like everyone heaps things on you or dumps things on you. And the longer we wait to um, receive forgiveness from that, the worse off we feel. Uh, the Bible actually uses this terminology. I believe it's in uh, Timothy. It talks about how your conscience can be seared, meaning that there's no feeling, no touch point from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit pricks you and speaks to you through your conscience. It's one of the ways. And so if your conscience is seared, then you can't even hear the Lord speak to you. And if you can't hear the Lord speak to you as a believer, you're in a dangerous place. Because you will start being like the people did in the book of Judges where they just did and chose everything that was uh, right in their own sight. Amen? So all of those things can happen, and it's just crazy because the, uh, the, the blessing that Jesus gave to us is that we don't have to wait one time a year to receive forgiveness like the Jews did. Jews had to wait on, in the old covenant once a year to have their sins forgiven. I can't even imagine that. And they couldn't even get forgiveness directly from themselves. They couldn't go directly to, uh, to God and receive forgiveness. They had to go through their priest. Once a year you had to wait and you couldn't even go to your, uh, to, you know, to your God yourself. You had to go through somebody else. And that is all of those things were done away with. And so now we have the blessing to be able to um, receive forgiveness anytime we ask for it in earnest, in sincerity, right, in humility of heart and soul. We can receive it if we merely ask for it. But the, but the, the, the prerequisite or the condition to that promise being met is if you want forgiveness, you got to give it. And there's no, there's no middle ground with that. Amen? And so if you're having trouble forgiving yourself or forgiving others, that is something that you have a conversation with the Lord about or a conversation with a licensed professional therapist about, a conversation with somebody that, can, that loves you enough and that you trust that, that will actually tell you the truth. Girl, listen, you can't keep, you can't keep, you can't keep living like that. Every time that he come around or just whatever, you can't keep, you can't live your life in that way. Baby, you got to forgive. Hallelujah. It's important for us to do that. Amen. And then the final thing uh, that I've learned just dealing with matters of forgiveness and working with people is not just forgiving yourself and forgiving others, but also receiving forgiveness for yourself. Jesus, um, you know, Going back to the story that we read in Mark 2, Jesus could have easily have said, you know, what he said to the paralytic at the end of, um, you know, at the end of that, that paragraph. Take up your bed, you know, rise, take up your bed, walk, and go home just like he did. But he was trying to prove a point, not only to the paralytic, but also to the, to the, the religious leaders and everyone that was in the room that day. That God has given man his delegated authorities, permission and forgiveness on earth to forgive sins. Not because inherent in us, we don't have, uh, you know, the, you know, we didn't, uh, we're not the sacrifice like Christ was. But because we are ambassadors of Christ and, and, and because, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the central tenet of the resurrection and his birth and ascension and all of that was so that you can have access and relationship with the Father, right? And that only happens through repentance and forgiveness of sin, confessing your sin, repenting of it, and then uh, and receiving the forgiveness that he has allocated or laid up for you. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, you know, we have to, in the same way that we have to uh, you know, render or give forgiveness, we have to also be willing to receive it for ourselves. Not just be like the paralytic man's friends and say, hey, I'm going to stand in the gap for my friend. No, yeah, sometimes you got to stand in the gap for your own self. Remember the Lord's prayer, right? The Lord's prayer, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, 
right? The great, the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor like you love yourself. When you forgive yourself, when you give forgiveness to someone else and you receive forgiveness for yourself, it's an act of love, self-love. Hallelujah. Because you then won't be a shell of yourself to your spouse, a shell of yourself to your children, a shell of yourself to extended family, a shell of yourself to your, your boss or your business or whatever. You can be your whole self when you're willing to give forgiveness and also to receive it. And I know that it is easier said than done because y'all thinking right now, you don't know what that did to me. I don't have to know because I know what the Savior did for you. So I ain't got to know what somebody did to you when I know what the Savior did for you. Hallelujah. And if you ever need a gentle nudge or loving reminder when you are tempted to not forgive somebody, think about your own life. And what you've done in the sight of God, and what you haven't done in the sight of God. And I always remember that. I said, man, how dare I not forgive somebody, even being tempted to fall into that, that, that cesspool of not forgiving when God has done so much and he's forgiven me so many times. Hallelujah. You don't want to live in a state of paralysis. You don't want somebody to have to carry you in to a meeting, whether physically, naturally, or spiritually, because you can't carry yourself, because of your own unwillingness to obey a foundational biblical principle surrounding forgiveness. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me read this on my closing. 1 John 1, 9 says this is one of my absolute favorite scriptures surrounding this topic of forgiveness. It says... That if we confess our sins, and not where you come with a laundry list like, here you go, Jesus, I'm about to read all of these off to you. I'm guilty of this. And he already knows the stuff you're guilty of. So confession of sin doesn't mean I, I'm going to list all of these 35 things, right? It's like, no, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the condition is you got to confess it. Part of the confession, a lot of times you know what it is. Lord, it's a sin of unbelief. Lord, I'm sorry for not believing you, not trusting you. Being angry at you or with you because you didn't come through like I thought that you should. I thought you should have spared my grandfather or spared my uncle or my aunt or my mother or whatever. And I'm angry with you. I thought that because I loved you and served you and you know, how could you allow me or someone that I love to be sick like this? Y'all, you know what? Listen, life happens to everybody. And the beautiful thing about us is that we don't have to go through life alone because the Bible says that we have an advocate through Christ that will lead us and guide us and has promised to never leave us, not in any season of life. Amen? So, if, you know, irrespective of what you're going through, whether you are, you know, stricken or uh, bedridden with some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of illness or sickness, you know, the doctors don't give you much chance or you're full of life, strength, vigor, health, and vitality. God is still good in both scenarios. He is still faithful in both scenarios. He is still kind in both scenarios, right? He is the lover of our soul. And, and listen, if it had not been for him and his sacrifice, we wouldn't even know what the true or authentic meaning of life actually, uh, what, it, what it actually means or what it entails. Hallelujah. And I'm just telling you, y'all, from experience, from somebody that has received forgiveness, been a recipient of forgiveness many times, of a person who has rendered forgiveness, of a person that has had to forgive themselves many times, that living in this place of perpetual forgiveness is a place that you want to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, let's stand. Now, I want to pray and dismiss our service, but if you're here and if something that I shared 
today um, spoke to your heart and uh, maybe made you upset, might have angered you, um, maybe made you a little sad, um, don't leave here without having a conversation with somebody. Um, we have um, our team, our altar team, uh, they're here and um, willing to pray for you, pray with you, stand with you, talk to you, um, start a conversation with you, befriend you. Uh, many of them have, you know, gone through similar situations as some of you, amen, and, um, and you just may need to talk to someone to get some things off your chest. And I would encourage you not to be afraid, not to be afraid. Living in a place of forgiveness, both giving it and receiving it, is a beautiful thing. Where you can walk and hold your head held high, knowing that, man, I, I try my best to live at peace with everybody. Hallelujah. So if you're here today and you have had trouble um, receiving forgiveness or giving forgiveness, our altar team, they are here, they can pray with you. And also, if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ um, as your Savior, as your personal Lord and Savior, and you would like to do that, our team can do that. They can pray with you um, as well concerning that. Amen. Don't walk out of here carrying the buckets and boatloads of guilt and condemnation and shame that came through the door of unforgiveness. No, God is too good for that. Amen. Hallelujah. So let me just pray and close our service. And then if you're, uh, we'd like to come down for prayer, you'd be more than free to do that uh, once I close, okay? Uh, Father, we thank you and uh, bless you, honor you, and give you glory and thanks for um, just how kind you are and all of the wonderful things that you have done. Lord, we ask and pray for your continued blessing, uh, Father, upon each one of us all. Uh, bless our lives, our lives, our health, our strength. Bless our homes, Lord, everything that our hands um, set out to do. Bless it, um, Father God, so that you can get glory out of it. Lord, where there um, are uh, unresolved and unsettled matters um, in marriages, um, Lord, in, in, in our homes or uh, with family members, friends, um, Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would uh, help us to be serious in this year about the ministry of reconciliation, about laying our pride and our egos down, um, being willing to be the big, uh, the big man or the big girl, and to pick up the phone and call to initiate the conversation uh, that has been long, for many of us has been long overdue. Um, Lord, I pray that um, just believe, Holy Spirit, that as I was sharing Your Word today, that. You are bringing instances and people and situations and conversations to those who are listening. You are bringing those people and those things to their minds, and and um, and, and uh, which is typically a sign or indicator that there's some unfinished business um, um, as it pertains to forgiveness in that area with that person. Um, I pray that in the hustle and bustle of our day and fellowshipping with fr family and friends and loved ones that, um, that we would not gloss over um, what, you, uh, what you spoke to us and what you shared in, in, uh, in, uh, in a moment uh, this morning and this afternoon, um, but that you would sear those things in our hearts um, so that if there are conversations that need to be had um, concerning receiving forgiveness, or giving forgiveness, or just saying, I'm sorry, um, Lord, I pray that those things would not be left undone. We honor you and thank you, Father God, for your continued faithfulness. Thank you for your son, Jesus, um, who died so that we might live. We honor you and bless you and just ask and pray that, um, that you would just bless us and keep us, make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lift up your countenance upon us continuously and always give us your peace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said amen. amen.